Hi there, Allison here with another Cap Franc du Jour. Today we are in the Santa Inez Valley in Southern California and we're looking at the UD 2019 Cabernet Franc. Launched in 2011 by Santa Barbara native Justin Willett of Tyler Winery and longtime friend Eric Railsback, UD focuses on Loire Valley grape varieties such as Sauvignon Blanc, Chenin Blanc, Menel de Bourgogne, and of course Cabernet Franc. And Justin and Eric's affinity for these grape varieties really follows similar reasons to why I and so many other individuals have gravitated to the wines of the Loire Valley in recent years. With increasing prices in Burgundy, Bordeaux, the Rhone, Northern Italy, the wines of the Loire Valley offer immense drinking pleasure, but at the same time, they are great values. So today's wine is taking us to the Santa Inez Valley in Santa Barbara County in Southern California. And this region is actually better known for producing rural class Pinot Noirs and Chardonnays. Currently, there's around 5,500 acres. That's around 2,225 hectares of Pinot Noir planted here, and approximately uh, 4,700 acres. That's around 1,900 hectares of Chardonnay planted here. But what does the picture for Cabernet Franc look like in Santa Barbara County? Well, there, uh, there really isn't a lot of Cabernet Franc planted here. Currently, there's around 108 uh, acres. That's around 44 hectares of Cabernet Franc planted here. And while there are not a lot of examples of Cabernet Franc from this particular part of California, I have had a chance to try a few of them. And for me, this is really one of the most exciting regions for Cabernet Franc in California. Now, for those that are not familiar with the microclimate here in the Santa Inez Valley, at first glance, one would think that it might actually be too warm for a grape variety like Cabernet Franc. And indeed, we are really far south. Uh, we're about 100 miles, that's about 170 kilometers northwest of the city of Los Angeles, and we're situated around 34 degrees north latitude. And if we jumped to the other side of the Atlantic, that same latitude would put us in North Africa, specifically Northern Morocco or Tunisia. But here in this particular part of Southern California, the topographic landscape changes, and this has a major impact on the microclimate here. So following much of the coastline of California are the coastal mountain ranges that run north-south, and they help to block out the influence from the Pacific Ocean, which is to the west. But in this particular part of Southern California, the coastal ranges end and the transverse ranges begin. And the transverse ranges start at Point Conception and they stretch around 500 kilometers inland. And the important thing to remember about these transverse ranges is, as the name would suggest, the orientation is east-west and not north-south. And this creates a series of valleys, uh, like the Santa Inez Valley, that are following this east-west orientation. And that means that these valleys are open and exposed to receive the cold influence from the Pacific Ocean to the west. And that actually makes the Santa Inez Valley a lot cooler than many regions that we would find in Northern California. The Santa Inez Valley can actually be subdivided into uh, four distinct sub-AVAs. The uh, Santa Rita Hills AVA is the furthest west, uh, and this one really has the uh, strongest impact from the Pacific Ocean, and this is where we typically find a lot more Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. And then as you move inland, uh, you're, they actually say that you gain about a degree in temperature for every mile or so that you move inland. So by the time we hit uh, the Happy Canyon uh, sub-ABA, which is uh, where the vineyards for this wine are located, it's actually warm enough now to uh, ripen Bordeaux grape varieties such as Cabernet Franc. Another thing to note about the microclimate here uh, in uh, this particular part of uh, Santa Barbara County is that as we are moving inland uh, along the Santa Inez Valley, uh, the, the diurnal range in temperatures actually gets wider. So again, when we're here in the Happy Canyon AVA, 
Uh, the daytime temperatures during the summertime will typically hit around mid 30s or so in terms of Celsius, and then they'll drop to around 10 degrees Celsius in the evening. So we have that wide diurnal range in temperatures. And of course, we know that that wide diurnal range means we will uh, see a longer growing season that will slow down ripening and preserve acidities. Another uh, important thing to note here is that, as I mentioned, we are really far south, and that would imply that the sunshine is going to be much stronger because we're closer to the equator. But because of the influence of the ocean here and the fogs and the mists that uh, come off the ocean, the sunlight is actually a little bit diffused, so it's a little softer. Uh, so that in, co in combination with the fact that the days are shorter here uh, compared to what it would be if we were at a more northerly latitude, uh, there, the sun, while intense, it's not, um, not quite as intense as what it could be. So that coupled with the microclimate that we find here, um, the sugars in the grapes actually accumulate a lot slower. So we have really long hang time here. And in terms of this vineyard specifically, as I mentioned, the vineyards are located in the Happy Canyon uh, sub AVA. So we're about 55 kilometers inland from the Pacific Ocean. So we do have a bit of an influence from the Pacific Ocean, but it's not quite as intense as what, uh, what it could be. And then uh, in terms of the vineyard blocks themselves, there's two blocks that are going into uh, this wine. We have uh, one block that is around 4.2 uh, acres, and this was planted in 1998. Uh, and this block uh, is sitting on a bit more of a western facing exposure. And then there's another block that's around six acres. Uh, and this block was planted in 2015. And this block is actually uh, own rooted Massal Selection Cabernet Franc. Um, these two vineyard blocks, I should say as well, in terms of their elevation, they're at around 215 to around 275 meters above sea level. That's around 700 to 900 or so feet above sea level. And these two vineyard blocks are also very close to the Santa Inez River. And that actually also helps to provide a little bit of a cooling influence to these particular vineyard blocks. And finally, in terms of soils, um, there's a few things uh, that are worth noting here. The topsoil is a light sandy loam and it's about 50 centimeters or so deep. And then the subsoil is clay and that's about 70 or, se 70 or so centimeters deep. And then we have gravelly clay after that. And the clay plays a really important role here in the vineyard's microclimates. Of course, clay, it retains moisture and we know that Cabernet Franc is, uh, is not drought tolerant. So that uh, moisture retention capacity is very important. And also clay is a cooler soil as well, uh, which is of course good for Cabernet Franc. Well, from a winemaking perspective, um, there's a few things that are worth noting here. The fruit is hand harvested and it depends on the vintage as to uh, the approach that Justin takes here. So usually it is a combination of destemmed fruit and whole cluster and he will adjust that depending on uh, the vintage. Uh, so for the 2019 vintage, it was about 50-50. So half of the fruit was destemmed and it was left whole berries, so not crushed, and then half of the fruit was left whole cluster. The fermentations are taking place in open top fermenters, stainless steel and oak, uh, and they are with indigenous yeast as well. And um, in terms of the uh, cap management techniques, Justin really does not do a whole heck of a lot. He really just wants to infuse uh, the skins and, and the juice and the fermenting wine. He will go in and do some pump overs from time to time, but generally speaking, he tries to just leave it be. And the wine will stay on skins for uh, generally around two or so weeks. And then once the wine uh, is pressed off the skins, it's then transferred into a 10 year old French oak barrels uh, where the wine rests for about um, seven to eight or so months before it is then bottled. Um, so yeah, let's get into this wine. I should note as well um, that this vineyard, and it seems to be a really, ha I've had this wine before, previous vintages, and this vineyard block seems to be really special for Cabernet Franc. And um, Justin uh, did a really great interview with, uh, with David Hinkle from Skernick back last February, and he talked at length about the details of this vineyard. He, he gets really, really long hang time uh, for his Cabernet Franc, and typically they're achieving uh, potential alcohols uh, of around 13%. 
Uh, so it's really interesting that he can achieve um, such sort of moderate alcohol levels with such long hang time, particularly in a, a climate that is really quite uh, quite far south. So um, it's just a particular point that I think is really, really quite fascinating. So let's get into this wine. So the nose does show the hallmarks of a little bit of that whole cluster influence. There is a really lovely perfume. And in terms of the fruits, I'm getting a nice mix of really pure, sweeter fruits, red fruits like cherry, raspberry. There's a little bit of a cassis thing going on here too. The perfume is gorgeous. Those floral notes really come through like sweeter florals, like a bit of violets here. And then in terms of the herbaceousness or the purzines, I really love the profile that I'm getting on this wine. It kind of reminds me of Garrigue or like Herbes de Provence. So it's like that mix of rosemary and thyme and a little bit of bay leaf. There's maybe even like that little bit of like a lavender thing going on in here. But really pretty. There's even like a little, almost like a eucalyptus -y thing going on as well on the nose, which is quite, quite interesting. And the nose is kind of spicy too, which I like. Mm. Oh, those same fruits come through really nicely on the palate. And uh, I would say the acidity, super refreshing. There's a juiciness uh, factor going on in terms of the acidity and the fruit profile. The, the wine, I would say, leans a little bit more on the savory side. Um, it's got a nice mix of the sweeter fruits there that are balancing the savoriness, but I do like the savory uh, herbal undertones that I'm getting here. And it is a bit more spicy on the palate, which I really, really like. Uh, and I'm getting notes like black peppercorn. There's a little bit of a green peppercorn note here as well. Yeah. In terms of the tannins, they're fine, they're, they're firm, and they are finely woven, as I said, with a nice velvety texture. There's a little bit of chalkiness to the finish as well. And I'd say there's a moderate amount of tannin here. There's nice structure. There's a good tension in this wine between the freshness of the acidity and the texture and the, and the impact of the tannins. There is some good uh, tension here. There's like a nice little acid um, spine to this wine, which I really like. It has a medium weight, super fresh, really elegant, that graceful finesse driven style of Cabernet Franc, which I absolutely love. And you do sense that there is something kind of special here in terms of uh, this vineyard spot. You know, you know it's not the Loire, but at the same time, you can't quite put your finger on it. There is something kind of new world about it as well. Uh, and it does have that slightly sunny kind of California uh, demeanor to it. Hmm. Yeah, it's just a delight. And particularly uh, this time of year, you know, summertime, this is the sort of wine that I think would be really enjoyable on a table. Chill it down slightly. There's sufficient structure, I think, to stand up to some grilled foods like grilled lamb chops or grilled vegetables or things like that. Um, but there's also that juiciness factor, which provides a sense of ease and drinkability to a wine like this. So I think it's doing a nice uh, interplay between structure and seriousness and uh, drinkability and, and ease. And, you know, as I said, you know, I've had a number of examples from uh, this particular region in terms of Cabernet Franc, and I really hope that they plant some more Cabernet Franc in this part of California, because I think, I think there's some beautiful terroir here for this particular great variety. And I think uh, Cabernet Franc has adapted to, to this area really, really well. If you have had a chance to try this Judy Cabernet Franc, let me know what you thought of it in the comments below. Or if you have another favorite uh, producer from Santa Barbara County that makes Cabernet Franc, let me know who the producer is and what your favorite wine is in the comments below. And of course, as always, I will be back again soon with another wine. Cheers.